This is Football CFB, the home of unique football companies. You scared off the vultures I never told you. You scared off the ghosts living in my head. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Football CFB. Today I'm joined by one of the iconic voices of football. George Sefton has been the announcer at Anfield for 50 years and the best way to open this episode is from Sir Kenny Dalglish. George Sefton is part of the brickwork at Liverpool Football Club and was witness to so many iconic moments. He has lived through a huge chunk of our history from when Liverpool were in the second division when he used to come to Anfield with his father all the way to being crowned World Club and Premier League champions. It's been a roller co- coaster ride, and George has been there for all of the ups and downs, but mainly the ups. First of all, George, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. As I was saying off air, I've just had my second jab, uh, so that's a, a big landmark, obviously, and uh, the way things are. Uh, there's lots of landmarks in my life at the moment, obviously the... 50 years is one of them. Uh, getting back to Anfield when there's a crowd in will be another one uh, I'm looking forward to. People uh, do say to me quite often, won't you be glad to get back to Anfield? And I say, well, I've never been away. In fact, I've spent more time at Anfield in the last 12 months than in any previous 12 months because uh, I'm still going to all the games. And before we went back to behind closed doors. We had an awful lot of trial runs. You know, we had games uh, between the first team and the under-23s. We had friendlies against Blackpool and Blackburn. Uh, then we had a couple of just dummy runs where there was training session going on just to make sure of the logistics at Anfield, make sure the staff could get in and out, knew where to go, what to do. And all the rest of it. So I'm. Uh, it's it's going to be good actually getting, as I say, actually getting back to um, you know normal, whatever normal is now will be will be so good. But that's probably not going to happen till August. Absolutely. Anyway. It's, it's been a strange journey um, over the last year, <clears throat> as you yeah. say, without crowds. But the, the first major question I've got for you: You've been the stadium announcer at Anfield, such an iconic venue, for fifty years. The first question is a very broad one. Very simply, what does Liverpool as a football club mean to you? Everything. Um, you know, I, I keep saying that Anfield is my second home, um, which is true. I mean, my poor wife, you know, she's got used to it over the years. We've been uh, married 51 years this year. So my work at Anfield has coincided with my, uh, my long marriage. But She's got used to everything revolving around Anfield. If I, you know, if you want to go on holiday, if you want to go to a theatre, uh, to a music gig, anything at all, we uh, first thing we have to do is look at the, the fixture list, and um, even that's not as simple as it sounds nowadays. Because as you know, uh, fixtures can change at the drop of a hat, and, and frequently do. Uh, Once upon a time, I the first two or three years I was working there, I'd get uh, one of these student diaries in the middle of the year. When the fixtures came out, you'd write them in the diary, and that was it. (laughs) Now, you get your student diary, put the fixtures in, and then go go and buy a bottle of Tipex um, to to scrub them all out again. And you, you think... Well, that weekend, that international weekend, we we won't have a game. But then nowadays, normally, we quite often have a charity game, an LFC Foundation game over international weekend. And football can be played on any day of the week now. It used to be uh, Saturday, then Tuesday, or maybe Wednesday. Now we've got Monday night football, Friday night football, Sunday evening, 7.15 kickoff. Um, is an absolute pain. 
Um, I, to be honest, I prefer Sunday football. You know, Sunday afternoon's fine, but he, that means you can go shopping on Saturday and you're know, like normal people. But as I say, the whole the whole thing revolves around uh, Liverpool my entire life. And uh, as, I, as you know, I'm referred to as the voice of Anfield. Uh, even this morning when I went for my jab, the woman filling me for me and suddenly looked up. I said, she said, are you the voice of Anfield? I said, yes. And when I retire, whenever that may be, I won't be the voice of Anfield anymore. I'll just be uh, old Fatso who lives at number 72. That'll be, that'll be me. That'll be quite a, a come down. That's, um, I'm going to keep going as long as I can. But, uh, but as I say, everything... I do in life revolves around the, around Anfield, around the club. That's that's incredible. And and the first question I've got for you about your journey: How does yeah. one become the stadium announcer at a football club like Liverpool? Well, normal people. <laughs> I know a few like this. They they start off um, with a small club, you know, non-league club, amateur club. Um, some people come up through hospital radio and know somebody at the club. Um, I've got a lad in Australia who follows me on Twitter. I talk to quite often. He uh, wanted to do something similar to me. He followed, as I say, he followed me on uh, online. And he started with his local junior club when he was about 15, I think. You know, with a crowd of about 50 people in there and worked his way up. He's now, I think it's Adelaide United, he does the, uh, the, the PA for now, and he's, it's been fascinating to watch his journey. In my case, it was completely different. I was at a match at Anfield uh, one spring evening in 1971. The guy on the, the old tannoy then, uh, I didn't know at the time, he was a stand-in for the regular fellow who was top class and he used to make bloomers every week he'd announce names wrong he'd play records the wrong speed and make announcements at the wrong time the whole shooting match and I was there with my wife one night and he made a, a foul up and I said oh this guy is an embarrassment to Liverpool Football Club and she just looked at me deadpan and said it's all right for you standing down here but you couldn't do any better and um, for whatever reason, I've never worked out to this day. I took up the challenge. I went home and wrote a long letter to the club secretary, who was then the equivalent of today's CEO. And um, my letter landed on his desk, apparently, at exactly the same moment they decided to give this other guy the push uh, for the new season. So I was invited in. Had a chat with the boss and then given the trial run. Uh, the trial run technically is still running. <laughs> um, I've never been actually been told that you know, uh, the job's yours, son. Um, but obviously it um, it worked out, and I've um, I'm part of the furniture now, as uh, Kenny said. You mentioned your, your wife challenging you to say, well, do you think you can do a better job? And, and you take that yeah. challenge on. How did you initially feel when you get into that booth for the first time? Well, it wasn't as far as the boo. The, the, the first day uh, I was actually working there, August the 14th, 1971. Uh, in those days, you had to go up a, the fire escape on the outside of the old main stand through the roof of the main stand uh, which was enormous. I would never uh, fail to be gobsmacked by that place. And then down a sort of submarine ladder onto the TV gantry. On the first day I did it, obviously it was the first time I'd been up there with people in the place. And I just froze. And I stood there and I looked down at all these people, you know, look, looked around and said to myself, what the blue blazes am I doing here? Then I thought, well, all my friends and family are, you know, know what I'm doing today. So I've either got to get on with this or go home, pack a bag and go abroad for a few months out of the way. You know, there's no middle ground. So I took a deep breath. And uh, it's like players say, you know, when they play in the cup final, they're very nervous. But then 
uh, as soon as kickoff comes, they're fine. And it was the same for me. Once I got through that body, and I was I was fine. Obviously, uh, it's a unique experience talking to that many people at once. Um, You've got no idea what it's like until you actually try it. Although I find uh, uh, overall, I'm much happier talking to 50,000 people than you know, a couple of dozen in a room, mostly, because they're right on top of you. I know I always say the same thing. When I was, um, let me think, 1995 at Wembley, uh, they, the FA took me down there. and I was out on the pitch talking to 84,000 people. Um, but my worst experience was at Rochdale Rotary Club in 1999. Uh, after dinner speech, there were 21 of them in the room, didn't like scousers, didn't like football. And that was terrifying. It was much, much worse than ever talking to big crowds. But I got through that one. I was just so mad because all my... After five minutes, all my good jokes had been and gone and not a murmur. So I just threw my script away and just went for it. And um, it, that, that was another um, turning point because I've done an awful lot of talking to businessmen, lunch clubs, rosary clubs and whatever ever since. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. In terms of uh, Liverpool, you talked about the, the experience of climbing down the, the submarine ladder and getting into to sit you when you see all the people below you. Yeah. When, when was the first time that, obviously you're used to going to Liverpool as a fan first and foremost, when was yeah. the first time you got used to being part of the club as such where you felt, wow, well, I'm here now? It, it's strange. It sort of crept up on me over the years. I still think of myself as a very minor part of what goes on. Um, although I've been speaking to a lot of people the last couple of weeks, um, Liverpool fans from all over the world, I've, I've been doing a lot of podcasts and whatever to publicise the book. And uh, so many people have said that um, I'm part of the experience. I, I, I know what it is. It's because... People under 50, when they've been to the ground, they've never heard another voice. You know, I'm part of the, the setup. The it's the what they call the fan experience nowadays. It's the not just the football, it's the uh, what do they say, the smell of hot dogs, you know, the music, the the chanting, the crowd noise, and um my voice in the background has just been part of it. I know over the years there have been people who didn't really think I existed. They thought I was just some sort of computer-generated voice on the, the PA. It's very strange. Uh, and I've had, I heard a few people talking about um, the music at Anfield, and they'll be saying to me, oh, they played this and they, they played. I said, no, they didn't. I did. That's completely, 110%, all completely my doing. I put the, the CD or the memory stick in the kit. I press the button. I introduce it. That's me. It's not, I don't know who you think, you know, does all this. And they um, they look at me as if I'm crazy. But um, it's, uh, and the, the other thing is, I know I don't look like I sound. If you've only ever heard my voice, and then bump into me, you get quite a shock. I, I, I say there's a uh, there's an awful lot of disappointed women around Merseyside. You know, they they turn <laughs> up, they they ex, they're expecting Tom Cruise, and they get Mr. Blowy. It's it's quite a come down, you know. But uh, it's it's part of the uh, of the game, I'm afraid. And in terms of your role on a match day, uh, what time would you arrive at the ground at in terms of preparation? W what's involved for you leading up to a match? Well, um, on a normal match day, obviously we haven't had any this season because um, my lo role has been very, very limited this season. I've been at every match. Um, I've been playing bits of music until recently at the moment. Uh, we've got somebody else playing the pre-match music, but he's playing a, a selection of stuff that the players ask for while they warm up, basically. 
But during the normal season, last let's take the season before last, which is the last normal one. I get to Anfield probably about four hours before kickoff. Um, I only play music for the last two hours before kickoff, but before that, you've got to make sure that uh, the technicals are working. And obviously, the first thing you've got to make sure of is the fact that I'm actually there. If, for instance, you know, I you know, had a, a heart attack that morning at home and didn't turn up, or my car broke down, or whatever, if I didn't turn up, they, they need a bit of notice to, uh, to work out what to do. I do have a stand-in nowadays, which is nice. But then we have to make sure that the CD decks are working, the USB ports are working, uh, and more to the point nowadays, the guy who operates the scoreboard and the VAR screen, he sits uh, next to me, and we've got to make sure all that's working. And it, they, they rebuild that system every match, so there's a lot of connections to go wrong. They quite often do, but they you've got a couple of hours to get it sorted and all work out what to do uh, in, if, if it didn't. Then after that, um, I'm just it's just a question of um, playing music to the crowd and making a couple of commercial announcements at, at a given time. And then obviously you've got, uh, you never walk alone at a specific time. The Nowadays, last few years, we've had the Premier League anthem. You know, the music they use while the players are shaking hands. Do you remember that shaking hands? I used to do that to people. And... <laughs> um, and, uh, and, off, and off we go. Uh, the music I, I play nowadays um, takes a lot more involvement than you'd think it does because obviously I'm retired from full-time work. Um, when I was working nine to five somewhere, um, I'd, what I'd do, I'd, on my way out to work in the morning, I'd pack away some... Uh, compilation CDs or specific CDs that I wanted to play to people and just work my way through them at an evening match or of a Saturday, obviously, go straight from here to the ground and do the same. Since I, I retired from the nine-to-five world, I've spent a lot of time between games comp compiling playlists uh, from various sources. Obviously, I've got a cracking CD collection uh, here. I think, well... Well, yeah, there's, there's, there's CD racks all around this place. Um, CD towers there are now. And uh, for the last few years, a lot of it has been digitised. So on this laptop I'm using to talk to you, there's about 7,000 tunes I can pick from. And then I'll listen to uh, a lot of radio. I watch things like Jules Holland's uh, Later With, I'll pick new music from that and some old classics from that. Um, people will write to me uh, quite often and say, look, uh, I'm in this band, here's our first single, what do you think? Uh, I do a lot of that. I've got a reputation for playing local bands, which I'm very proud of. And uh, then I've also uh, spent years establishing contacts with a couple of the big promotions people in London. So I get supplied with a lot of a real lot of good good music that's about to come out. Um, and it's uh, the guy who sends me stuff is responsible for uh, supplying all the football grounds in the Premier League and a few of the smaller clubs as well. So I get really good selection. In fact, quite often the problem is cramming it down into two hours. Um, you know, more than once I've sat here and timed and downloaded um, the music of my playlist and realised there's about three and a half hours worth of stuff there. And I've got to make some serious decisions after that because obviously the way things are now, the, the vast majority of the people don't get in their seats until the last half hour. So there's something you really, really need people to hear. Uh, you know, for instance, I'm thinking of, for instance, the... Hillsborough charity record, that sort of thing. That's got to be in a certain time slot. Um, so it, it's, I, I spend an awful lot more time than people realise, you know, compiling the list. And then 
come kick off time. It's you know, you never walk alone, and away you go, lads. And uh, so another 15 minutes at half time. It's great if I've got uh, half time to myself. You know, I'll I'll pick some belters for half time if I can win. I always have a quiet record in the middle uh, of my half time music because people. I, I take the view that people need to take deep breath for three minutes, especially if it's been a you know um, really intense first half. Um, and apart from that, it's, it's a question of play it by ear. Obviously, sometimes we get emergencies. Um, although that doesn't happen so much anymore, but all in all, it's 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 quite a long day. You know, it's say four hours beforehand, and, uh, two uh, well, two hours including half time, and then depending on the you know the match, hanging around, everybody's left the stadium, and it's it's safe to go because it you don't turn the PA off till the place is empty. But Murphy's Law says that when if I uh, if it did turn it off early, there'd be there'd be something going on. Touch wood, although we've got some very uh, clever schemes to evacuate the place, we've never actually had a real live emergency, you know, bomb threat or that sort of thing. So uh, you know, it's it's good. But when that does happen, we're ready for it. In terms of your role um, in, in any stadium announcer. But, but especially when, when you're at Anfield, the, the moment where a goal goes in is such a, a euphoric moment for the passionate Liverpool fans mm. and for those yeah. watching at home as well. When do you time coming in to announce who's scored? Is there a particular technique you have for that? Well, yeah, um, yes, you've got to wait till your initial noise subsides. But of course, that's all changed now. We've got VAR. If the round thing goes in the net... You can't shout goal, you've got to hang on and watch the, luckily, as I say, I sit with inside of the VAR screen and I don't know uh, if they're checking it. Well, they, uh, they check every goal, but if it's, there's no problem that the words check over will appear. Uh, but then that's when you can uh, announce the goal. But um, you've got to be very careful because, you, well, you know yourself, you watch enough football that quite often what you think was a perfectly good goal will turn out five minutes later not to be a perfectly good goal and the, the scoreboard's got to be changed back. I don't shout goal over the PA because I'll make a fool of myself or once or twice I have done and a couple of minutes later the guy on the VAR mic has shouted uh, uh, no, no goal, Fred Bloggs was offside or whatever and um, it's it's very complicated. It, it's surprisingly complicated, even though you think you know what's going on if you're watching on TV. When you're watching the antics behind the scenes, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And in terms of VAR, and, um, as you've said, that's really changed, I suppose, the way yeah. you would approach yeah. that. How would you have approached it before VAR? Is it a oh. case of let the noise yeah. just dim slightly yeah. and then you come in? That's right. Uh, again, normally there'd, there'd be a roar go up when the, the goal is scored. Then there'd be a lot of hugging in the centre circle or whatever. The, then the noise would come down again, and then I could announce it, and you know the the crowd will just cheer me announcing it, basically, which is quite funny. But they um, and again, if it's down at the Anfield Road, then it's it's quite possible a lot of people on the the cop end haven't quite twigged who scored it, who scored it. And if it was, in fact, a goal, I mean, there's been incidents over the years. I'm thinking of Peter Crouch's first goal. Um, you know, he came to us with a wonderful goal scoring track record, but for the first two or three months in Anfield, he couldn't score to save his life. And then I think it was Wigan we were playing and he, he actually scored, but it was one of these goals where was a complete melee in front of the goal. The, we knew the goal, the, uh, the ball had gone in the net, great. But somebody, I, I was about to announce it, and somebody poked his head in from the next room who had a better view and said that was an own goal by the goalkeeper. 
So if it's an own goal, I don't announce it because it's you know it's it's not very good for for anybody. But I was watching one of my monitors. You know, my room now looks like the cockpit of the the Concord. It's you know, it's amazing. And on one of the monitors, the entire team had clustered around Peter Crouch, and he was grinning like a Cheshire cat. And I thought, right, I'm not going to do it. I announced it as his goal. I guess somebody else came in and said, you got that wrong, it was the goalkeeper own goal. And I said, I don't care, because when I announced that, the cheer went up, the crowd was so pleased we'd scored, so pleased Peter had scored, the whole team got a lift. Peter got a lift, he'd broken through the barrier, and it was wonderful. And then about, I think it was about six weeks later, the uh, FA's dubious goals panel gave the goal to Peter Crouch. So I was vindicated. I, was, I just, I would have loved to have gone around everybody who told me I was an idiot and said, read that. Uh, and the same thing happened with Stephen Gerrard a couple of months later. Um, I, I gave him a goal and uh, I actually heard the TV commenters say, to say, oh, George has got that wrong. It was uh, an own goal by so and so, so and so. A couple of months later, Dubious goals panel announces that was Stephen Gerrard's goal. So I was vindicated again. And I say, you know, there are times when I, I get, you know, I get things wrong, and times when I get things right, and it's really satisfying. And in that case, I did actually happen to bump into the TV commentator before the next game. I said, You've got a minute, you know, did you read this? And uh, that was brownie points galore for me. I was so smug it wasn't true. You know. <laughs> In terms of uh, yourself and your passion for the club, what are the mm-hmm. iconic goals and moments that, that that just come to mind as soon as you think of your role and being in that that position? Well, um, obviously, you know, I'm going to tell you the same as everybody else would be. Um, the Saints at the end goal that got us through uh, to the 1977 European Cup final, the first win. Um, one of my favourites was never seen by anybody else. It was a reserve match. Um, and the guy called Phil Charnock, young lad who I've known since he was little, played in the same t- team as one of my sons. Uh, and he was playing for Liverpool Reserves one Saturday afternoon when he used to do that. No cameras in the place. And he scored an absolute scourge of nearly the centre circle. I've told people for ages after that, it was probably the best goal I'd ever seen at Anfield. So that was nice on a personal level. After that, as I say, David Fairclough against St. Etienne. Um, In 2005, uh, the goal that Stephen Gerrard scored against Olympiacos when we thought we were going out. And uh, I'm renowned for being very laid back and and, uh, calm. But there's a video on YouTube somewhere of me announcing that goal. I was in hysterics. <laughs> I'd completely lost it. I was so um, so pleased that we weren't going out of that um, competition because in 2005, it was 20 years since the Heistel. And at the Heistel, my eldest son came with my wife to see me off at the airport. And... Um, one reason or another, he got into his head he might be going because his, his couple of his mates from school had gone to uh, Rotterdam the previous week to see Everton win. And I looked him in the face and said, look, I think you're just a bit young yet, but I promise you faithfully, next year if Liverpool will get to the European Cup final, we're going together. And of course, then Heisel happened. We were banned uh, for years and years. And... In 2005, I was thinking, this is our chance. After 20 years, we're going to get to the European Cup final. Uh, And, of course, we did. In the end, um, he and I couldn't get tickets. People don't believe that, but, you know, um, my other two grown-up children and season tickets, they they, they went off to Istanbul, but I didn't. But the following year... We missed out when in 2007 my eldest son and I 
went to Athens, uh, ignoring the club, or I didn't even ask the club for a ticket. Uh, we made our own travel plans, and <laughs> one of my sons, I'm, never, I'm not quite sure which, had a friend from university who was going out with the secretary at the FA, and she sold him two tickets, uh, the best seats in the house, basically. So we got them, and we never charged for them, incidentally. They were, you know, she, she got his, his son's credit card number. It was never debited. So that was that was you know satisfaction. To, you know, obviously we lost, but we had such a good week away traveling to and from Istanbul via uh, Crawley to um, Sofia to Athens to Sofia to Heathrow, back to Crawley and back home. Um, I said we had such a good week away together. It was like the classic father and son road trip, so we didn't care. Uh, that was quite an experience. But um, then finally, as I've said to a few people lately, if I close my eyes now, I can still see the fourth goal against Barcelona in 2019. Um, you know, I was, um, I was watching uh, Trent putting the ball down on the corner spot. And as I say, you can close your eyes. It was a, it was a three-way move that the ball boy. Uh, good quiz question. His name was Oakley Canonier. I, f- I believe he's at the academy. I'm not sure if he's still there. But if you have seen the run through, he was so quick. Ball, Trent, Trent puts it down, walks away, then zoom, turns around. And there's only Divock Origi was actually awake in the middle there. And it's in the back of the net. And I didn't announce that because I thought the referee's going to blow his whistle and say, take it again. And he didn't. Then it, it gradually dawns on everybody that we've scored and we're winning. And again, I was hysterical announcing that goal, but the the time between that goal and the end of the game, it was it, it felt like about 10 days, no, nine, half an hour. It was just so, so tense. Um, but that, that goal, you know, It'll live in my memory as, as long as I live. In terms of uh, the difficult times, as Sir Kenny said in the quote at the start, you've had far more highs as a Liverpool fan than yeah. lows. When the club is going through maybe a difficult spell, uh, bless him, I hate to single him out, but I, I think back from my obviously generation to when Roy Hodgson was in charge and it wasn't oh, quite yeah. of the, the, the standard that Liverpool are used to. What's it like when being in your position then? Because you're probably going into games thinking this could be difficult. Yes. Well, as I say, when Roy came, I was very pleased because obviously he's a very, very experienced manager. But there's a saying at Anfield, when managers come from outside who have another long association with the club, they either get it or they don't get it. Rafa understood the ethos of the place. He understood the history, the traditions, uh, the fans' outlook on life, everything. Roy, God bless him, he just didn't. I mean, I think the first press conference he mentioned, my friend Sir Alex Ferguson, at that point... You're dead in the water. And um, I, I, I said about Roy Hodgson, I always got the feeling he set his teams up to not lose rather than setting his teams up to win a game. And it was it was deadly. I remember that it was only, what, five, five months, six months he was at Anfield. But I remember that when it all came to an end, we had a Youth Cup match at Anfield on the Saturday morning. Um, one of the guys in match control room next door to me uh, had a contact at the training ground. And um, I don't know, to this day, I don't know which fella it was. I don't want to because he was almost like an undercover agent. But I was sat in my room watching... Uh, Sky Sports News and they had some of me standing outside Melwood and this guy was phoning my mate next door to say there's something going on and then um, after a while 
the guy from Match Control comes running and screaming, he's gone, he's gone. Roy, Roy's gone, he's gone. I were going, thank God for that. Very sorry, Roy, but you know, this is the end of a a bad spell. And then uh, I was still watching Sky Sports News and the a good half hour after that, their, their correspondent was down there. So well, nothing's happening here at Melwood. Yeah, and we're thinking, oh, yes, it has, mate. You haven't been here. We knew, and he didn't. He was standing there. And then another half hour goes by, and the guy from Match Control comes running in again, screaming, Kenny's back, Kenny's back. And again, it was about half an hour after that that the Sky Sports News uh, reporter announced that Kenny Dalglish was back. We've been party party ever since. We can even hear all the stewards around the, the, around the pitch down below. You know, they can hear all the shouts and yelps. And Kenny's back, Kenny's back. And um, again, that was that was that was a, a great day. But um, over the years, managers come, have come and gone. Sometimes you, they go when you don't think they're going to go. Um, and sometimes you wonder why on earth they went. Um, and you know, obviously, the the uh, as Kenny uh, when he got the the job the second time, I remember somebody asking him. Um, was he happy to be back? And he he said something along the lines, I, I can't be happy because a good man has lost his job. And that, that's typical Kenny. And you know, the most sensible thing I heard all week, you know, and um but um it, it's just amazing to be around watching these things coming and going, you know, the, and um I, I say to this day, I'm still amazed that some of the people I talked to and who talked to me. I, uh, again, another tale I've been telling since the book's been put together. And I remember it must have been the very early 2000s. I was coming out of the car park one night after a game and Kenny was going the other way on foot. I, I presume he'd, he'd come around the, the, the ground to go and you know, go in the uh, one of the lounges and... Uh, I just smiled at him. He said, good night, George. And I stopped dead in my tracks. And I, I when I got home, I said to my wife, Kenny Dog, please just call me George. That's the first time I'd ever actually spoken to the guy, I think, in, in uh, you know, face to face. And obviously you'd bump into him around the around and about and um whatever. But that was that, that it, it sounds stupid now, but that's that's the way it was. And then uh, the same with Rafa. Um, a oh, few years after he left us, uh, he came to Anfield to be a, an honoured guest at a charity run there and um, greets me like an old friend. And I was chatting away. And, he was, and then um, while the 96, um, the run for the 96 run was actually taking place, I was standing with in the VIP section with uh, Rafa, and my, my wife uh, had come with me just to get some fresh air. She had the dog with her, and uh, I said to Rafa, "You know, say hello to my wife. You big fan." Blah, blah, blah. And he went over and he's uh, he said hello. And said, what kind of dogs this? And they, I said, nobody spoke to me after that. The two of them were talking, just discussing the the respective dogs for 20 minutes. It was hilarious. I think this is so surreal. Yeah, but um, again, it, it, more often than not, you know, I'll, I'll stop somewhere and look around and say, this is crazy, you know, because I'm here with so-and-so doing this. And um, it happens so often. I mean, yesterday I did an interview for Premier League Productions and they had us um, sitting out at a little table with two teacups and um, teapot outside the the stadium, and the people wandering past saying, "What on earth is going on here? Those people are freezing to death, trying to have a tea party." And there's cameras there. Um, or again, my favourite. So I went to Tenerife to see the supporters' club about five years ago with Phil Neal. Um, 
uh, the, the do they had the evening we were there. I, I, I said to the, the first thing I said to the, the crowd when I stood up was, this is crazy. I'm standing on a rock in the middle of the Atlantic. You know, to my right hand is the most capped England player ever, the most, uh, most decorated Liverpool player ever, England captain, Liverpool captain. And in my left hand, I've got the European Cup. You know, how much more crazy than that can you actually get? It's, well, I'm used to it now. It's, um, you know, it's, again, I've been there that long. I don't think there's, there's much you could throw at me now that actually surprised me. Or, um, no, but I'll tell you the one occasion I was coming out of Anfield after a game and I bumped into James Bond. You know, it's, it, that doesn't happen very often. You know. <laughs> you know, Daniel Craig was a big Liverpool fan going back you know, to his youth. He's, people forget he's, uh, he, he's from this corner of the world, so it's not unusual, but um, just absolutely wonderful. It's been an incredible uh, journey. And in terms of in terms of the book, um, it's <clears throat> released at the at the start of May. How how proud are you of the book? Because it's certainly um, it's certainly something that is for me as a football fan. Yeah. I'll be all over it. I hope so. You know, tell all your friends. I mean, when when the first copy turned up, I was thinking, "Wow, this is you know, it's like you know, a baby. You know, this is all my doing." And um, you know, people have read it. Uh, some serious people have read it and uh, they they like it and um, you know it, it's just been absolutely wonderful to you know to hear and, and what I'm, I caught this week I think you've seen this the gaffer got his copy and, yeah I say when I saw that I just you know I, I sent it round the other family and then um you know, put it on, well, everywhere I could find, you know, Twitter, Facebook, the whole shooting match on it. That one picture alone, uh, Jürgen, God bless him, has, has pushed my street crowd up through the roof and made the whole project worthwhile. You know, um, it's, again, another surreal moment. Actually, my, I've got a godson who messaged me last night and said, is that a Photoshop job? And I said, no, it isn't. You know, God bless him. Jürgen took you know five minutes out of his busy schedule this week to do that for me. And you know, it just doesn't get any better than that, really. It's, well, as I say, it's certainly gonna be a book that that resonates with not just Liverpool fans, I just think football fans in general. And I, I would hope encourage so. I would encourage everyone listening to to have a look for it when it comes out. I'll put the links um, out there as well. George, it's Thank been you. an absolute pleasure, and and I hope you you mentioned at the start you want to keep doing this for as long as possible. I hope you continue for many years yet. Thank you very much. I'll uh, ask. Somebody asked me yesterday how long I'm going to go on. I said, well, I don't know. I'm going to get to the summer, take a deep breath, and see how I feel. I'll do it, but. Um, some days I think, oh, I could do a rest now. Then other days I can't walk away from all this. Then again, I think I might get a call. I haven't spoken to the new CEO yet. I haven't clapped eyes on him. I was very friendly with Peter Moore. But the new guy I just haven't seen. I, I might get a phone call when I finish speaking to you and come down to my office and see me. And uh, I might get the I might get the, the push. I might get run over by a bus, you know, going to the shop this afternoon. I just don't know. I'll, while I can, and while I think I'm doing a, a reasonable job, I will. I know I get abused sometimes on Twitter. Why don't you pack it up, you silly old fool? And then I, I don't reply to abuse, but I just retweet it. And then a few hours later, I'll come and look through the responses and Thank God for Liverpool fans that are always, always sort of ninety nine point nine nine percent on my side. Come the day that it swings round the other way, I should be out of here like a shot. I wouldn't want to hang on where I wasn't wanted, but uh, 
at the moment, I do actually feel wanted, which is nice. So there you go.